Welcome back to the Genetics Lecture Series. Once again, you're joining me, Drew Wico, and hopefully learning more about what genetics is all about. I know it's a complicated field, so the goal is to sift through all the information out there and make better sense of it. If you have any questions about what we talk about today, any previous material, or have feedback on how this series can be improved, we would love to hear from you. Today's lecture will be focused on direct-to-consumer testing. Before we get to that, though, we will review the key details of Lecture 4. Lecture 4 covered the difference between monogenic and multifactorial disorders. Remember that monogenic disorders, also sometimes called Mendelian disorders, mean that there is one gene almost always responsible for the disorder. We talked about cystic fibrosis and how almost all cases are traced back to one gene, CFTR. We also covered multifactorial disorders, sometimes also called multigenic or polygenic disorders. These disorders are typically the more complicated genetic disorders, because there is not just one gene responsible for causing the disorder, but multiple genes. These create a large challenge for researchers, since being able to tell whether a change in one gene is responsible for the entire disorder is almost impossible. Researchers can look at a number of cases of a certain disorder, and each person can have different alleles that all still add up to the same general disorder. Furthermore, we tend to see a bit more variation in these multifactorial disorders. So a good example to remember for these kinds of disorders is autism spectrum disorder. We also briefly covered the challenges in research that I just mentioned, but also that research is a slow process. Although we want to find ways to remove negative factors of a disorder, we also want to ensure that they are safe. This means that some drugs take multiple years to get tested and approved. This lecture in the series is going to pivot away from a lot of the specific genetic details we've been discussing and instead fo focus on direct-to-consumer testing, or what I might refer to as DTC for short. This is a group of genetic testing that has gotten insanely popular this past decade through a few different companies that we will chat about. I'll go over the basic order of how these tests work, what many of them seek to do, as well as the positives and negatives. The goal is to cover this new realm of private companies and what they offer, because they do in fact do a great job of selling their product. The issue is they don't cover all the risks also associated with their products until you've already purchased them. The process of DTC testing is fairly straightforward. You purchase the kit from the company, you follow the instructions after you register it online, provide a saliva sample that would have your DNA in it, and send it to the company. Once the company receives it and processes it, they give you tons of different information, all based upon the type of kit you purchased. Pretty cool, right? The fact that they can learn all of this information on you, your health, and your family's ethnic background all from a small tube of saliva. It almost seems like it's out of science fiction. As I mentioned, you get different results based on the type of kit that you purchase or the company you purchase from. 23andMe is arguably the most popular right now, and they offer health kits, ancestry kits, and combo kits that provide data on both Ancestry and Health. Companies like Ancestry and Family Tree DNA lean a bit more towards the Ancestry component alone, but there's a laundry list of companies to choose from for whatever you're looking for. So now we've gone through the primary info on what DTC testing is. Let's go through some of the positives of what they offer, especially through their advertising. These companies offer the ability to just learn more about yourself, whether it be what diseases and disorders you're genetically at risk for, or even gaining more insight to your own ethnic background, that information can be purposeful and beneficial. These tests can answer questions you have about your own genetic makeup so that informed decisions can be made about your own health. If you're provided a positive from a DTC testing company, it can be incredibly helpful since it might not have been something known, and gives the opportunity to prepare for what treatments to pursue or how to combat the disorder. It can kind of provide direction, in a way, as to how to tackle this newly diagnosed disorder. Another consideration is that it can help people do family planning. With certain recessive disorders, some families decide to not have their own children and instead adopt, simply due to the risk of passing on the disorder. This is not to say that every family should do the same, but these cases do exist. As for ethnic background, that can provide the opportunity for more information when talking with your doctor. If you think your ethnic background is one specific makeup, then you discover that you actually have another ethnic group in the mix, that can change things. Some ethnic groups have been linked to a higher risk for certain genetic disorders, so the ethnic background information can be incredibly valuable. 
All of these pieces of information can be great to have, but let's also take a moment to consider what the risks are. The risks may not be immediately apparent, especially because who doesn't want to know everything they can about themselves? But it's necessary to consider what risks are present so you can make an appropriate decision for yourself. We've talked continually throughout this genetics series that genetics is complicated. Even as I myself will be getting a graduate degree in human genetics, I still need to spend a lot of time reading about genetics to keep up with what everything means. For most people, it's hard to make sense of what an quote-unquote at-risk evaluation from a DTC company really means. With variation between how different disorders are inherited, how they affect each person differently, and other factors, the information may not be the easiest to understand. With this is the issue of an unexpected diagnosis. An example of this would be if you had submitted a health kit to 23andMe and one of your results said that you have the APOE4 allele variant. Studies have shown that the APOE4 variant significantly increases the chances a person will get Alzheimer's in their life and also increases risk for other disorders like high cholesterol. If somebody's not expecting any negative results from a test like this, it can potentially upend their world. With all the stressors that already exist, they now need to understand what this variant means, and having no medical professional to, there to walk them through the results makes it even more daunting. It is not uncommon for people to get obsessed, stressed, angry, or even feel guilt with results. So having a genetics professional there to walk you through it is almost better than doing it alone. Another issue is the treatment for many of these disorders, or in other words, the lack of treatments. Looking back at Alzheimer's, there's currently no available treatment. So now the test results have come back with this allele variant, told you that you're high risk for Alzheimer's, and that there's no treatment available. That's a lot of information to take in and process at once. This is a common issue since many genetic disorders do not have a treatment, so it becomes a larger burden when the discovery is stumbled upon like this. The next issue to consider is the accuracy of test results. All of these tests have some fraction of them that don't get the readings right, which would be a false positive or a false negative, for example. However, the best and most accurate tests are typically used for clinical diagnosis. With many direct-to-consumer companies, there's a much lower accuracy requirement than clinical tests. This creates a massive issue, because what if they inform you that you have a certain genetic variant, but in reality you don't? That creates a lot of unnecessary stress. Something to keep an eye out for with these companies is if they are CLIA certified, C-L-I-A, which is the certification they must acquire to be able to clinically diagnose disorders. Some companies do in fact have this certification, but it is a variable to consider when thinking about doing DTC testing. Finally, a brief note on what differs with these companies compared to clinical genetic testing is that they are, at the end of the day, private companies. These are not meant to provide a diagnosis, but rather risk of a positive test result. Due to this, companies like 23andMe and Ancestry are actually not subject to HIPAA. So, if 23andMe wants to provide your genetic information to a study, and it's part of the agreement of taking part in their service that you agree to, then they can share it with whatever third parties they wish. There are a few more things to consider with this kind of genetic testing that I didn't want to necessarily confine to a positive or negative. Instead, there are things you could, should consider and think about before doing a genetic testing service like these. First is insurance coverage. There was a law passed in 2008 that banned genetic discrimination, such as an insurance company changing coverage or premiums based on the result of a genetic test. This same law prohibits genetic discrimination in employment. That's great. However, the same does not apply to life insurance companies and their coverage, so be aware of that. A life insurance provider can change their own coverage or even deny coverage based on the results of a genetic test. It may not seem like an immediate thing to worry about, but there have been court cases about this. Another factor to consider is when you receive a result. Given you share much of your DNA with your family members, will you share your results with them? Will you also explain how your positive or at-risk result also increases their risk? Now, there's no right or wrong answer to this, but this is a factor that many people don't consider until the issue is right in front of them.
This can create a lot of tension in a family, especially if the family members disagree on the approach that should be taken. All of these details throughout these slides may seem like a lot to consider, but it's important to think about so you can make the best decision for you and your family. The verdict on whether or not you should participate in these kinds of testing is ultimately up to you. Nobody else can make the decision for you, but hopefully this presentation has at least given you some perspective on the different details involved with DTC testing. I, myself, have personally taken part in one of these DTC testing companies, but I did so before realizing what risks existed. However, my own personal recommendation is that you should probably lean a bit more towards reliable testing through a healthcare provider, so you will also have the necessary support there if you do receive information you weren't prepared for. With any of these options, the best thing you can do is weigh the positives and negatives and go from there with what you've learned today. This week, we took a look at direct-to-consumer testing that has gained popularity these past few years. We talked about how these services can be incredibly helpful in giving you more information on your own health risks and ethnic background to help you better prepare for what might affect you. We also looked at the risks involved, such as how you can receive unexpected results, and that can create a lot of stress. At the end of the day, DTC testing is an option that many people choose to pursue. Next week, we will be returning to our discussion on family pedigrees, walking through an exercise on building a pedigree from scratch. By going through that material again, we can make sure it all makes sense and you can build your own family pedigree to provide to healthcare professionals. We'll go through the specific details that are required to map out your pedigree and even look at some real world examples again. Once again, if you have any questions about material or recommendations for this lecture series, we would love to hear from you. We hope you enjoyed this lecture and thank you so much for joining me.